Okay, I think we'll get started. Hi, everybody. My name is Arthur Samuelson. I'm the program director at the Rowe Conference Center. We're located in a beautiful corner of Massachusetts in the western part of the state. How many of you have been to us? Um, have any of you have see a few people? Well, I hope to welcome you all back, and I hope to welcome those of you who haven't yet had the pleasure, or we haven't yet had the pleasure of meeting you. Uh, we've been there for almost 100 years. We run programs for adults from September through June on spirituality, um, personal growth, all the creative arts, nature, and social change, all things we think go into making for a flourishing life. And then in the summer, we run summer camps for kids, and we have some adult summer camps as well. And of course, these last two years, we've been able to do this only online, and we are slowly reopening now. And in a couple of weeks, we're going to have Patch and, and Susan offering a five-day um, clown school, which they will tell you about, and you may have a chance to talk to them about. So I'm not going to take any more of your time because we only have an hour for this program. So I want to welcome um, Susan and uh, Patch. Patch has been a I'm not gonna tell you very much about them because you must already know. Patch has been a doctor now for 49 years and has been building orphanages, schools, community centers, medical clinics in over 20 countries. And Susan, his uh, partner is a poet and artist and one of the founding members of the school for designing, um, what is it? So designing a social a society. Uh, design, designing society. Anyway, welcome Susan and Patch. Underwear, underwear, wherever you are, underwear, 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 wherever you go, you're in your underwear. How you doing, big boy? Just making sure I don't fall. Yeah. Underwear. It's more of a problem when two people wear the same underwear. Pants. Underwear. Okay. This is my fish. Now, fish is my friend. I never go anywhere without him. And when I like one, he gives me a kiss. Aww. Would you like to see the triple threat? Yeah, I think I would like to see the triple threat. Wonderful. Well, I always have it with me. And let's see here. First, I put in the cheek spreader. Can uh, I see it? Uh, 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 Can uh, they uh, see it? Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, and now I put in the teeth. Uh oh, where's the bigger? Uh oh. Uh oh. Uh -oh. Maybe you're going to have to do it without the booger. Uh, you see it? No, I think we maybe forget about the booger today. 
Uh, this is nice enough, I think. Um, finally, I got a little on my nose that I'd love to put in people's mouths. <laughs> Now we do the underwear song, soft love. Underwear. underwear. Wherever you go, you're in your underwear. 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 Wherever you go, you're in your Okay, my life as a clown. Da -da. I grew up a weird, nerd, dweeb, dork, sissy boy in a military family that my dad was stationed in Germany in 1954 to 61. I was 16 when my father died on the, uh, in the military. My father moved, my family moved us back home to Arlington, Virginia, and the racist world I found there made me lose my mind. When I heard the N word, I would say, stop it, and scream and scream and scream, stop it. I didn't understand why other people didn't scream. I had three mental hospitalizations at age 17, and the medications they gave me, I hated their effect on me. But at age 18, I was present at Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, and it changed my life. Hearing that Dr. King, what Dr. King said, I thought to myself, you don't kill yourself, dummy. You make a revolution. I decided not ever again to have a bad day. I decided to be six qualities, happy, funny, loving, cooperative, creative, and thoughtful all the time. And that was 59 years ago. Happy and funny led the path. I was playful, but not yet a clown. I spent three years as an undergrad living at home, attending George Washington University and got in medical school early from 1967 to 71. I attended the Medical College of Virginia in Richmond. I saw firsthand how the doctors treated their patients. I didn't like it. So in contrast, I decided to become dramatically friendly. It was the time of hippies and that movement made me feel I could be exactly the doctor I wanted to be. I and did a large amount of reading great literature. I started to think about performance in everyday life. Performance in everyday life. Imagine that maybe performance doesn't belong only to the special times of like the opera and the music concert. Those are performances that are not everyday life. They happen, but we see them as kind of unusual. But I started thinking when I was thinking of being a clown, what would it be like to be a performance all the time? Here's the recipe. Supposing the moment you wake up, up to the moment you go to sleep, you are a performer. You think of yourself as hmm, performer. Let's walk performance down off the stage and into everyday life. And to consider the presentation of self to be itself a performance.
So somebody could say, oh, this is kind of like intellectual. I don't know about this, but uh, how do you define performance now that you've taken it off the stage and put it in there? Here's a definition. Performance is when having an intention, you choose amongst alternatives for the best way to show that intention. So performance is not showing off, it's showing. So that you don't think I'm crazy, let's think for a moment about <coughs> your clothes, the clothes you're wearing, you two, person out of Australia, I see you, okay. Just take a look at those clothes. In the morning, when you probably put them on, you had alternatives that you could select from, and you could try to make your clothes selection reflect what you're intending to emphasize and do that day. So in a certain way, when we put on our clothes, we're putting on our costume, performer. And then imagine the things that you were thinking of talking about today, maybe a funny little thing on the internet and something else like that. For a performer, that's your script. Those are your mind. And now the last thing I'll say about this performance in everyday life, which is a possibility, is that when you are reaching in your costume and going, no, not that, or yeah, I'll choose that when you are reaching for your costume, you probably used either the conjunction because and maybe you used so that. So maybe you said, um, well, I'd like to wear that decolletage dress uh, because it'll show off my shape, but maybe it's not such a good idea because it's kind of cold. So you reason by means of because. And that's the typical reasoning that we do. We often look back into the past, which the because allows us to do. And we say things like, oh, well, I don't think I'll go to that party because I'm so shy, because I've been so shy. Or we say, oh, I don't think I really want to talk about that subject because it's so controversial. But what we're offering you in terms of thinking of yourself as a clown or thinking of yourself as a performer in everyday life is to consider the possibilities of so that. So you wear that decolletage dress so that you get to show men what they miss. So you decide that you're not gonna be doing this or that. So that some new things can happen. So I turn you back to Patch. Hearing what Dr. King said, I thought to myself, you don't kill yourself, dummy. You make a revolution of love. I decided not to have any bad days. I decided at 18 to be these six qualities all the time. Happy, funny, loving, cooperative, creative, and thoughtful. And I've done that now for 59 years. Happy and funny led the path. I was playful, but not yet a clown. I spent three years as an undergrad living at home with mom attending GWU and got in medical school. From 1967 to 71, I attended the Medical College of Virginia in Richmond. I saw firsthand how the doctors treated their patients and I didn't like it. Where was the friendliness and the length of time of exploring? So in contrast, I decided to become dramatically friendly. It was the time of hippies and that movement made me feel I could be exactly the doctor I wanted to be and did a huge amount of reading of great literature. I started to think about education. <laughs> Who am I? My name is Susan Ferenti. I work and play with Patch Adams. The identity I probably smile the most about is one where we have created a school. A friend of ours, Annetta Pedretti said, do the things you want and afterwards call them a school. And we have used that idea. We decide on things that we think are relevant or 
truthfully irrelevant, uh, provocative. The things that Arthur mentioned that the Roe Conference does is exactly where we think, oh, wow, let's call that a school. Um, but the school that we have has got a really pedantic name. It's called the School for Designing a Society. The School for Designing a Society. The School for Designing a Society. That's yeah. my cue. But I didn't finish with what I was saying. Okay. The School for Designing Society was founded in 1991 as a project of people who want to change society by means of composition, design, and desire. So rather than scrambling for a comfy spot in the current system, we asked people to spend time with other interested people imagining and designing a system that they would prefer. I wanted to be a free doctor, wanted to spend a lot more time with patients. I wanted to be their friend, duh, to hug them, play with them, joke with them, feel well with them. It was a political time, a time to be creative. By then I was a joyful, playful soul. Deciding to create my own hospital, I found that being full of joy and play, the recipe for being a clown, was what patients wanted. Friends wanted, I wanted to be as a way of life. I did a one year pediatric internship at Georgetown and at that point, I realized I had had enough. I could not work inside the current medical system. I could not be their thing and that I would create the Gesundheit Institute. So the next year we started the communal structure of the Institute as a way to immerse ourselves in it. We went on a 11 month bus trip, 1973-74 to Europe, North Africa and Russia. 12 to 18 friends lived on the bus with us. We had simple clown costumes, musical instruments, and invited the people we met to play with us. We came home to the US determined to live together. So 12 to 20 adults and their children lived together in Fairfax, Virginia on 12 acres. We built a stage for theater, collected costumes and did clown events, had big parties, one to three times a week with dancing and deep friendship. We called ourselves a, a hospital and for 12 years saw so many patients in our home hospital. I created an invention that we got a patent for called the sensual box. This was a one person box with maximum stimulation to all the senses at the same time. <laughs> People called us the zanies. I wonder why. <laughs> I made over a hundred hours of movies, Super 8. There was always laughter, play, and togetherness. Because and so that, I'm still pursuing that direction. I tell a story of because and so that in action. Clowning in nursing homes. That's the place where you find us clowns, us accordions, and us nursing homes all together. I was with two medical students and we had somehow gotten detached from the big group that was climbing through the nursing home. There was just the three of us a little lost and thinking, where is everybody? I was with my steady. Accordion. I'm protected. I always know what to do because I can always play the accordion. <laughs> but these medical students were distressed. They kept saying, we don't know where we're going, Susan. Where are I? I said, well, I think the group is downstairs. You can hear it by the noise. Then one of them turned to me and said, um, the thing is, Susan, um, Julie and I are thinking that we'd, we'd like to leave. I said, what, the nursing home? We just got here. And they said, yeah, but um, 
and Julie spoke. You know, um, we kind of stuck our head in a few of the rooms and um, it's so depressing, Susan. I said, yeah, well, that's kind of like why we're here. We're here so that we could kind of make it crazy and maybe keep the depressing part, but silly and depressing or funny and depressing or singing a song and depressing. And the Julie went, no, no, um, no, I, I really feel like we've got to get out of here. I have never been in a nursing home before. I said, wow, you're a med student? She said, well, it's got nothing to do with a med student. I mean, I, I, I just, um, I, I can't stay here. And the guy that was with her said, yeah, me neither. Then a person, maybe a nurse, maybe an aide went past. And I said, um, could you tell us, is this a special ward? Or she said, no, it's just an everyday ward. And then Julie, the med student said, um, but there's, ma'am, there's a, there's a guy in this room here and he's sitting up and he just stares. And me and my friend were med students. Um, we went in and we tried to say hi and well, but nothing happened very good. So is something the matter with him? And the aide or the nurse said, oh, well, nursing home. I mean, but the fact is he hasn't had a visit in a long time. And Julie said, well, like, how long? And the nurse aide said, oh, maybe a couple of years. And Julie said, but that's, you mean, he, you mean he's, it's not that he has a stroke or anything. And we sort of made our way slowly into that room. And there was this gentleman sitting up, staring at the wall. And I said to the two medical students, wow, well, let's, let's talk to you. Let's, Goof wow, let's do something silly. So that the day is an unusual one. So that. And the medical student said, no, no, no. Okay, Susan, we really have got to get out of here. This is bad for me, okay? Um, because I can only take so much suffering. I cannot deal with things on this level of terribleness. So I, Susan, I'm sorry, we've got to get out of here. We can, the guy said, yeah, I, I can't, I, this is, I can't stand this. I didn't bargain for this. Um, I'd rather read about it. I can't see it. Okay, bye. That was the triumph of the because over the so that. Because seeing suffering discouraged them. They just reached back into the because. And the hope of the so that. How many times I've done something silly, talked to somebody, tickle their foot. It becomes the subject matter for a week of people passing by. How are you, Irving? Well, that girl tickled my foot. That's an event. But that's only if you think in terms of. So that. As for healthcare, in this atmosphere of community, clowning, and zaniness, the idea of a free hospital based on friendship continued to grow. We bought 312 acres of land in Pocahontas County, West Virginia, and built several buildings, all the time planning how our ideal hospital would be. I have a lot to say about our building our hospital, but I want to make a few remarks about clowning. I think of about myself as a clown who is a doctor, not a doctor who is a clown. I like to think, us to think about that for a minute. I also say that clowning is a trick to bring love close. At the break, uh, let's talk about it. We continue to organize clown trips for People ages five to 92, one to two weeks long, all are welcome. These trips are important. We think of these clown trips as a kind of hospital without walls, wellness embedded in community. We have done more than 300 clown trips at a rate of seven to nine a year. I've found that the clown costume is magical. If you go on a clown trip and wear a costume and a red nose, everyone else assumes you're a professional clown. Ha <laughs> ha, tricky, tricky. And for 35 years, I've only worn clown clothes made by our friend Heidi with deep pockets for lots of toys. 
I've been asked to speak on the topics of humor and health. What is your love strategy? The joy of caring, living a life of joy, and the Gesundheit Institute. I have lectured and performed in every state in 82 countries. I'd like to close now with my favorite letter. One of the ways I've been doctoring after our medical practice close is I've answered over 500 letters from 130 countries. And this is my favorite, January 10, 2001. Hi, my name is Jesse Meeker. I am 12 years old. Because you got this today, it means that I have died. That is okay though. I got real sick about a year ago and I need a liver transplant. I am living in an apartment with my mom in Tacoma, Washington. My dad left us a long time ago because he had problems. Mom moved us up here to Tacoma to be by my uncle Bob. He works up here. My grandma lives in Canada and mom is going to take me back there. We are kind of poor and don't know anyone up here. I was real lonely until I met this crazy guy named Mr. Pete. Mr. Pete was pretty scary when I first met him. He came to the apartment to fix a hole we had. He is a painter here at the apartments. He was real quiet and a big man. I was in bed and Mr. Pete came through my room to do the job on his way out. I said hi to him and he started to talk. He asked me why I was home and I said I was sick and then I told him I was real sick. It didn't seem to bother him that other adults. He acted like it was normal for people to maybe die. He held my hand and asked if he could come back if my mom and I said it was all right. He talked to mom and she said it was all right. So Mr. Pete started to come by sometimes. Mr. Pete is my angel, Dr. Adams. He spends lots of time with me and taught me how to use Uncle Bob's computer. He has helped me write letters to people and to write poetry and stuff. He shows me how to use spell checker and grammar checker. That letter looks pretty good. We talk and talk and talk all the time. He says he stays with me when I want to cry so mom could get Ha, go have a break. This is real hard for mom. Mr. Pete writes stuff too, stuff about living and friends and stuff. He is also a very smart man. He has been to a lot of schools. You can just tell. He knows a lot about sickness and getting well. He said he was a quote suit, end quote, once, but had to give it up. He worked with families that were having real big troubles like alcohol and drugs and stuff. He said he became a painter here to have a break from that life. I think it was hard on him because he is such a great man and no one knows it. I saw your movie with Robin Williams. It was funny and sad. I am sorry you lost your girlfriend. That part made me cry. Mr. Pete told me that one thing I might want to do is write letters to people out there in the world that I thought were neat. He said that in that way, I could know that important things were told to important people and that it is important to let people know when they touch you in a good way. I am writing to you and to Oprah Winfrey and Rosie O'Donnell and Mr. Rogers and Kermit the Frog. I know he is a puppet, but he is so much fun. What I am telling everyone is about Mr. Pete. The best part is that he doesn't know it. That is the important thing because he said that he would mail all of the letters after I am gone if I go and he is mailing 
all of these letters about himself and he doesn't know. Ha ha. He thinks I am writing fan letters. I think I am pretty smart for being a kid. Mr. Pete says I am a smarty pants kid and that is about the same thing. I know that you are very busy and might not be able to do me this favor and that is okay. I think you would be doing yourself a favor if you talked to Mr. Pete and met him. I know that you will like him and tell him that I told you to call. That would probably make him faint. You should think about giving him a job. He is smart and loves kids. He is my angel and had time for me. He makes everyone around laugh till they cry. His are good laughs. Think about it for a while. His telephone number is, the code is, you probably want to get an answer machine because he is in and out, but he always calls me back and I know he will call you back. Mr. Pete thinks you are a swell guy. He said that certain souls are family and you are a certain soul. Thank you for reading this. Be happy for me. And that's my favorite letter. And now let's talk. Please be nosy. You can't ask a question we're not ready for. Um, you can all unmute yourself um, if you want to say something or put it into the chat and we can read it for you. And you don't have to like us. Hi, Patch. Thank you for doing this. So I'm wondering, did you call Mr. Pete? Duh. Of <laughs> course I did. I was thrilled to call him. And? And he was happy to talk with me. And he, he loved Jesse. And did she survive, Jesse? Well, Jesse died soon after the letter. <laughs> Tick, 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 boom. I would, I would like to know the status of your hospital now. What's been happening with it? And what's what, what have you been doing with the hospital and caring for people in the hospital? Well, you know, it's a really interesting question because the movie Patch Adams with Robin Williams was extremely popular. And the movie people promised me that they would build our hospital and they made hundreds of millions of dollars and they gave me nothing and didn't answer my five letters either. And 80% of the people who've written me and said, I'm going to donate to you, never happened. I've kept a sense of humor. We're still alive. It's a bit of a fragile time because of COVID. And if any of you could send us a donation, that would be greatly helpful. Or if you're connected to a big donation, great, please help us. And uh, yeah, it's uh, we have, as I said, 312 acres with three waterfalls, a four acre lake, a mountain of hardwood trees. It's paradise with great farmland. We've built three beautiful buildings and have the shell of our first really big building up. Whee! It's half built, a half built building. Let me speak. Yes. Um, so when you talk about sort of the, the status of the hospital, um, if we look at it in terms of, you know, four walls, big major tertiary care primarily institute, then yeah, we're not there at all. Um, the thing is we weren't really meant to be the four walls, the biggest building on the block, et cetera. Um, I've, since I go on a lot of the trips and work with people too myself, um, I see that the kind of spirit that we try to create, say, in a clown trip, which we think of the expression we were using as a hospital without walls. Um, how do four people go into a room where there's serious suffering and 
basically transform it in that time period. So we're not talking about, you know, these large, again, tertiary hospitals where um, people stay in for a while. We're talking about the capacity for people to wrestle misery out of a situation by their presence and that that could be considered a hospital moment if you wanted to. And I know this might seem like hedging, but the thing is like, when I look at count the things that we've done that in Argentina now it is required that pediatric care has a clown unit. Now that's our work. Our work did that. People think, you know, the severity and the seriousness and the solemnness of illness makes people think that it's an anathema to bring in an idea of clowns and silliness and ridiculousness. As a matter of fact, the new thing that we're trying to teach is ridiculous, which is carrying clowning to a stage of infiltrating our lives um, and in a, in a positive way. So when I look at the things that we've been trying to do in terms of maybe substituting four walls for a time period, you know, can I barter with you, sir, and say, um, what about half an hour of making people glad that they're there? As the accordionist, as one of the musicians, I get the chance to um, watch transformations happening where a room that had, you know, a lot of people under chemo go from a chemo ridden room into a party ridden room because of the presence of people who are determined to make those time periods matter. I'm talking a lot, excuse me, but I don't know if this is the direction of an answer that you would like or what. So you have um, some questions in the chat and one of them is, do you have any advice for people working in mental health care who get burned out after a few years? And then we also have Elena and Marco have their hand up next. Yes, and you're talking about the number one reason people are admitted to hospitals of mental illness. I can say this in 51 years as a family doctor, never once did I give a psychiatric medication or diagnosis. And I never needed to. I don't think the number one prescribed meds are antidepressants. And I don't think depression is an illness. I think it's a symptom of loneliness because as soon as they have a buddy, it changes dramatically. And so, yes, our society based on greed and power over others if you don't make your own mental health, you're going to suffer mental illness. Thank you. Next, we have a question from Elena and Marco. Would you like to unmute? Hello. Hello. Uh, we are from Italy. We are from Italy. Bellissimo. Uh, <laughs> so we want to tell you thank you so much because uh, Pat, you inspire my life uh, every day because I work with the little child and uh, thank you, thank you so much. You know, I would say, uh, excuse me, you inspire yourself. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> you betcha. And when you care and love yourself and love other people, you are inspiring. Okay. So next we have a question from Miguel. Um, hi, Pat. More, more than a question, uh, it's a pleasure to see you again. I had the privilege and honor of being your interpreter when you were here in Bolivia, when you came to Santa Cruz and La Paz. Uh -huh. And uh, it, it's wonderful to see you again. And, and as I mentioned, when I saw you, um, you were definitely, or your story in, in your movie, which I'm very sad that you were never, uh, you never received the, the deserved retribution. Uh, I almost took my life a couple of times and your life story made a difference in mine. And I have certainly taken the path of, of the red nose and uh, my life has been blessed by knowing your story and uh, having had the opportunity to meet you and share with you as you did. Uh, you're a remarkable man. You, you're, you're, your mind is, is amazing. I remember when we were in La Paz, uh, a kid was going through some issues 
And you turned to me and said, are you an interpreter? And I said, rumor has it that I understand a thing or two. And then you proceeded to recite a Latin American poet uh, for about five minutes off of the top of your head, uh, which I didn't even know that poem in particular. So just thankful to, for the opportunity to be able to see you again. And uh, my blessings to you and much love and light both to you and your partner. And um, and yeah, the, the, the world is a better place uh, with people such as yourself. And I just wanted to give you that recognition and, uh, and to send you all my love and good light. Thank you. Next, we have Elliot. Yeah. Hi, Patch. Hi. I don't know if you remember me. You supported my book called Positively Ridiculous. Oh. Now, wow. that, now that Susan mentioned the word ridiculous, oh, yeah. but you were so generous. I'm trying to show with your letters and your correspondence. And we spoke several times on the phone. And I just can't thank you enough for your warmth, your big heart, your generosity. And I want to promise you that your support of me and my work with the ridiculous, this that I will pay it forward to you. So thank you again. I just, I so appreciate it. So could I, let me just interpose here that um, somehow your influencer on Patch has been lingering because about three months ago, Patch said, forget this clowning stuff. Let's teach people to be ridiculous. And I thought, uh oh, the clowning already is way out there. But we've been, one of the things that we've been, he's been playing with is um, getting people, like two people in someone's underpants, um, which you can get six people into people's underpants. Um, and that's, that's fun and clowning. But the ridiculous thing is that Patch will get people, several people, in someone's underpants. And then he'll start asking kind of probing questions like, is anyone in the room feeling depressed? So it switches the, you, you go from giggling because of the underpants into like thinking, am I depressed? And what happens is people stand up to answer and inadvertently drag up someone who is stuck with them in the underpants, not really wanting to enter into this question of depression. And you suddenly see people looking at each other and roaring with laughter because it's as though the sidekick got drawn into the whole thing. And so though Arthur wants us to call this workshop that we're giving in December, or December 9th through 12th, he thinks it should be called the uh, clowning, something with clowning. We put, we mumbled to each other, no, we're gonna be teaching the ridiculous. So we're gonna go back and find your book and steal things. Fabulous. Fantastic. Well, yeah, I'll, great. I'll be sure to send it to you when it's published. Oh, okay. It's not published yet. Okay. I, somewhere in, in Patch's uh, collection of boxes, there is a printed copy of the book, but it, it may have gotten lost because Patch has so much correspondence. Yeah, but, but, but I'll send it to you when it's done. Great. Thanks so much. A lot of people. Okay, so we have one in the chat. And the question is, what types of antics do you do when you are visiting sick kids who don't speak your language. I've wa wanted to do clowning for a long time and often live in places where I don't speak the language. So please share some ideas with me. Yes, uh, I mean, first off, charge, go into the room. And when you say you don't speak the language, one way to communicate is to use the same language that the person listening is using. But the clown can have many languages. Nerfish, clarty, snurp, barful. And you, you can say it as if it's a very intelligent thing to say. You can pick up their foot and go, gosh, body total. And so the clown doesn't worry about whether or not they're communicating correctly. They're a playmate. Does that help answer your question? Where'd she go? Okay, well, don't jump off a cliff. <laughs> Next, another is iPhone? Yes. Um, we don't can't see your name, my dear, but iPhone three. 
She has her hand raised. Hi. Um, <laughs> it's such an honor to be here. And um, I got to tell you, I, um, I'm a substitute teacher in the town of Benton City, Washington, and the kids know me as Mrs. B. And every day I, that I substitute teach, I have Mrs. B's quote du jour. And um, I started thinking about you a couple weeks ago because one of um, the local people who I'm friends with, her name is Bethany Freeborn. She um, was at a camp in California with, um, and I think she was 16 years old. And I think she's like around 30 now or so, maybe a little older. And she had a picture of um, herself and you. And so I, um, I, I was just like, oh, I'm, you know, I, I hadn't thought about you for a while. And I know that you are a treasure on earth. And so I like when I um, substitute again, I do my quote du jour. So I decided, you know what, I'm going to start, you know, using some quotes from you. And so that's what I like to do. And I like to teach the younger generations about what a special person you are. And I also um, introduce them to people like, you know, Jane Goodall and stuff like that, people that they might not necessarily know. And I just want to um, thank you so much for what you do. And, um, you know, it's an honor, you know, honor being here, honestly. <laughs> thank you so much. And I want you to hear this, that I have told audiences all over the world that I am ashamed that a sports figure makes more money than the school teacher. For me, the school teacher may be the holiest person on the planet. We give our children to them and it's a blessing. So thank you for being a teacher and for saying what you're saying. You know, you. I, don't, I don't do anything that a nice person doesn't do on their own. You know, I'm, I'm just a well-known nice person. And, <laughs> and so I, I want you to know that I don't do anything that you don't do and that we are equals and team. I agree. I appreciate you <laughs> and everybody of your ilk. <laughs> and appreciate you and your ilk. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Patch, we have another question. Do you recommend that Retired healthcare professionals who have an interest um, in this go to clown school first? Well, you know, my, I never took a clown class. I never went to a clown school. I, I've only worn clown clothes now for decades and I've never worried. I've led over 300 clown trips to foreign countries, war zones, refugee camps, and I've taken ages five to 92, and I never worry about a person being a bad clown. The nice thing about a clown is you can stand there and go, oh my God, they're good, I'm no good, oh my God, I'll never be able to be a clown. And when a clown is saying those things and acting it, somebody says, wow, they're really good. <laughs> so it's, I've called clowning a trick that get love close and be loving and playful and don't worry about their judgment care about your connection thank you you Next betcha and write me i answer all my mail i've written over five hundred thousand letters to 130 countries mm, nice thank you and Pardon next me. we have andrea andrea yep yeah. Hello, so we are from Italy. Uh, I'm talking uh, from, for my wife because she doesn't speak English. Uh, so she met you almost 12 years ago in a workshop in Italy. And uh, you invited her on the stage. We don't know what, for which reason, but then she told her, you that she has a dream to, to start to do pet therapy with her dog. And uh, so, of course, you encouraged her to do that. And uh, so she she want uh, you to, to thank you again because uh, she started this uh, this dream and uh, she was so great and uh, she remember what you told her and so she still she she say that you remember that uh, you told her that uh, his your her dream was still in uh, your heart in uh, in uh, your mind 
And uh, she did in, that, in these last two, 12 years a lot of nice things because of the power you give her. So, you know, and of course, I would say it was the power she gave herself. But I'm very grateful for what you say. In fact, I'm going to speak with your partner in dog talk. <laughs> 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 We, we also do with the cat. Oh, <laughs> <Pet therapy. laughs> I speak cat and dog. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. You Thank betcha. You. Thank you. So we have Otis up, but I am going to um, put the information regarding the clown school at Roe into the chat for those of you who may have an interest. We hope that you will consider coming and joining us. So I'm gonna put that in now. So you have that information. And while I'm doing that, um, the next person is Otis. Do you have a question? You can unmute. Yes, I have a question. Does this nose look good on me? Well, that, well, <laughs> <laughs> of course, I, of course I, how I, much fun you're having. Um, that wasn't my actual question, but, um, well, I guess it was. Um, I do have another question, though. Um, I'm a, a person that's autistic, and I've also always struggled with um, uh, relating to people out in the regular world, um, and I'm not sure quite how to, like sometimes I get, um, uh, like I don't know how to read people very well, and someone, like someone, I may think someone's mad at me, but they really just, um, uh, just talking in a different way that I don't understand. Do you guys have any um, suggestions on maybe how to curtail that fear, so to speak? Well, decide to call yourself artistic, instead of autistic and then whatever you do becomes a gesture of art that that's a good idea i'm actually i am an artist and a musician too so it's funny you mentioned that so cut the other crap and say what you are artistic yeah that's a good one <laughs> and and if they're a funny person you can say fartistic <laughs> Yeah, or 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 if my name was Bart, it could be Bartistic, or Bartistic. You knew you were going nuts. <laughs> you know exactly where we're coming from, and so stay there. I'll stay here, and you stay there. I promise. <laughs> hey, uh, just a quick question: Did you guys ever know anybody named uh, Peter Gould and Stephen Stearns? Stephen Stearns, I, I've known a Stephen Stearns. He was a tall man. Yeah, um, when I was in um, in uh, grade school, um, there was a, a woman that taught uh, taught me called Claire Oglesby. I don't know if that name makes anything to you, but um, Stephen Stearns and, and Peter Gould uh, used to come to the school um, uh, once a week and 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 do clown things and walk and invisible walls and you know just kind of get the kids together and and you know uh just have fun basically right you remembered that i do yeah sounds great I, you know I, it's I, amazing how easy it is to get people to have fun yeah and that, I, I still i still have the uh the cloth uh nose they gave me <laughs> somewhere is that what you were wearing though the red one no. That's a different no, that, that was uh, a makeshift while other people were talking nose. <laughs> you may not know this or remember it, but Mary Poppins said and sang, in every job that must be done, there is an element of fun. Find that fun and the job's a game. And every task you undertake becomes a piece of cake, etc. <laughs> that that was yeah, but that was in the key of F minor, and you sang it. <laughs> um, we have we're coming close to the end. We can go over, but we had a question whether um, that we still have. Thanks for letting me share. 
whether we still have room in the uh, in clown school, which is from December 8th to 12th. And we do have room. And why don't you, could you talk a little bit about what that's going to be like, what you're going to do, why, why a school doesn't have to be a school? Well, I can talk about that. Well, uh, you know, we're dividing the time up into morning, afternoon, and night. And every afternoon, we're going to be clowning for a couple of hours. So it'll kind of be like clown school or clown play. Yeah, so it'll be outside. I mean, we will in the morning and in the evenings um, be trying ideas, taking stealing ideas from Jerry Lewis, uh, trying stuff so that when you get outside in the afternoon um, and there you are in a nursing home or there you are with little kids and you think, ah, what do I do? You think, well, I remember we tried this thing in the morning. So we're going to teach exercises. I don't like that word, but teach things to do that would use us as a group. So we'll learn some group songs, um, different approaches of stuff so that people can see all the time that there's a hidden chest of humor in many things, even particularly sad things. Um, but for us, it's really important that people know that this is not going to be studying clowning. So that's really good. It's going to be studying them it and then doing it and trying to find rapports with people in nursing homes, the best buddy on the block, um, trying to go way out of just clowning. Um, yeah, what? I was gonna say, for example, I'm gonna count to three and everybody's going to make a fart sound. One, two, three. Wow. <laughs> it, doesn't work. it doesn't work over Zoom. I saw that April was doing it. Yeah, uh, and, and April, April has been waiting patiently to ask you all question. Yeah, April. <laughs> oh, good job. <laughs> There's April. Now. Can I say something? Yes. Hi, I'm Patch. I just want to let you know that this is a dream come true that I actually um, see you in like in the video because you I just want to I got really emotional because nine years ago, I was super inspired of your movie. And yeah, I just want to let you know that you've changed my life, that you know, like you changed, you touched my life in, in a lot of ways. I'm actually here in Roanoke, Virginia because of you because i went all the way to west virginia to see your place and that's why i end up being here and every time every time i with my patient i always think of you even though like say they're mean to me i cannot be mean you know mean to them i try to make them laugh because that's how you really inspired me and i thank you for that and if i can be honest with you if you look closely at it, you inspired you, okay? All I can do is be me. But if you decide to take action, then you decided. Do you understand me? Yes. You are the great clown. Thank you. Thank you. You make me so happy, actually. Who made you happy? You. <laughs> Can you say, I made me happy? <laughs> Another question. Um, I, um, I, go ahead. We're, we're getting pretty close to the end. Um, I, let, why don't we stop here? I think that's a really great place to stop, actually. And thank you so much for doing this. And thank you all for joining us. And I hope that you'll come and be ridiculous with us on <laughs> December 8th as well. Um, we're going to be going to visit a lot of the um, places around our, our beautiful conference center and make people laugh and learn something about yourself and about, <clears throat> about life at the same time. So I, we hope Bring to Bring a crazy costume and nose. Okay. okay.
Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Woo! Oh, look forward to seeing you at row. Last question. Who's, who's, who's the best clown mirror mirror on the wall? Who is the best clown of all? You know, what's true about clowns is they're not judging each other. What, they're, <laughs> what they each want is for, they dream of a world free of violence, safe to women, and following justice. You know what? You know why cannibals don't eat clowns? No. They taste, they taste funny. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's why that. I suck on my thumb. <laughs> Patch, we do have a couple of comments in the chat asking about an address to write you. And do you have an email or somewhere that you would like? You know, I've chosen never to learn how to use a computer or a smartphone. But he welcomes so his... I answer all my mail at 122 Franklin Street, Urbana, Illinois, U-R-B-A-N-A, -A, Illinois, 61801. You don't have to like anything I say. You can make it a really nasty letter, a funny letter, or even in a foreign language, and I'll make up what it means. Okay. Let me see. One, two, three. I'll put that in the chat. She's cute. Mm -hmm. We're still on the camera. No, no, don't. Okay, everybody, we're going to turn it off now. Thank you so much, and go make the world a better place. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Ciao. Oh my gosh. Thirsting for the if, if I don't see you in the future, I'll see you in the pasture. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually on a Zoom call, so try later, okay? Everybody's still there. <laughs> yes. Bye bye, everybody. Goodbye, guys. Happy Saturday. Ow. Ow. May I <laughs> hope your bad days. <laughs> Ow. Oh, we can't get rid of I like to say if you have food and a friend, what are you bitching about? <laughs> so. So okay. are, we're still on. We're People still on. Um, I'm going to close the room. Yep. Yeah. Thank you, Arthur. Thanks Thank so you much. so much. Thank everybody. Oh, Kara Fazio had something to say. I I was kind of shy at first, so I apologize for taking up too much of your time. I just um I just want to say thank you so much for having this event. It has been such an honor to be a part of it. Um, I just want to say what everyone else has said, Patch, you are an inspiration. I know you say we are all inspirations, but you are such an inspiration to not just for myself, but obviously everyone in this room and everybody globally. And I just want to say thank you so much for sharing your gift with everyone. And you know, it was both Susan's and my gifts. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Ciao. Bella, ciao, bella, ciao, bella, ciao. We don't want to leave. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm going to have to leave. Bye, bye. <laughs> I'm looking for your nose. Oh, wait, I found it. Oh. Yeah, some of you are still there. Look, I found my snot. So I want to show you it. Let me see. Thank you. You may think it's candy, but it's not. <laughs>
Isn't it beautiful? Got a booger, got a booger. Got a booger in my nose and I can't shake it off. Got a booger. You can imagine as a clown that I put the booger in my nose and I lower it into the mouth of a stranger. So we could say that psychically I'm a bit of a bad boy. So I'll pick the booger and put it back in the little case. Thank you. Uh -oh. Patch, they're all gone now and you're all done. Thank you very much. And you and Arthur are thankful. Was this a good event for you? Yes, you did a great job. Thank you. It was How great. many people came? We were up to, um, I think, 32 at one time I saw. So. And what were you hoping or expecting? Uh, I'm not sure what what Arthur was was hoping for. I'm new. I'm just kind of in training. So um, I thank you. And it was just perfect. And it was um can tell you mean a lot to people. <laughs> all right, David, thank you. And I'm going to sign off now. You guys are all set. Yeah. Are you, are you saying I'm mean to a lot of people? <laughs> might be. <laughs> thank you very much. You mean mean? Okay. <laughs> be well. Bye-bye.